this. I have to do it. Like that. Hey, th th that's me making pictures. Um, not obviously not a good. For me, it was really the moment where I finally understood why men go to football stadiums. It is amazing. It is amazing feeling to be a part of a roaring crowd of thousands of people who seem to have at least some sense of solidarity, who feel that we are there together. And it's incredibly loud because, you know, the organizers had some speakers, but basically you couldn't hear anything what they're saying but everyone was screaming. Uh, and it's not very usual for demonstrations. Usually you really have to make some effort to tell people, you know, shall we have this song or the other, or, you know, scream with me. Here, everyone was doing that on their own. Uh, it was really like this powerful roar of a thousands of people who are angry, who are together, who are determined, who are really doing this for a purpose. And that sense was truly revolutionary. And after this, um, this um, demonstration um, was officially closed, there was a group of like, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 who just said like, we are going to take the parliament. And we just went there. And that, that part was totally illegal. Uh, but people on the streets just, you know, were joining us. Uh, there was a, a group of drummers who was, you know, giving us the, the powerful feeling that we are also loud enough. And it was raining all the time. And actually, we, we just went there. And I saw this young girl of maybe 20 who obviously left her office because she was very elegantly dressed and she was in this, you know, high heels and she was carrying a banner. Uh, I'm not getting, I, I'm not taking this shit anymore. And she was standing there alone in front of the parliament screaming. And that was a, another moment that I felt like, wow, this, these people are not, these women are not going to be silenced so easily. If this is how they feel, if this is how they act, if this is what they're doing. And that was just Warsaw, and the Warsaw demonstration was actually not the biggest one, because uh, probably the biggest one was in Wrocław, another big city on the south, um, uh, on the southern western border. And actually over uh, 140 cities, villages, uh, places all over Poland took part in organizing rallies, demonstrations, marches, uh, very different type of stuff depending on their possibilities and you know how, how many people they could count on. This is Łódź, uh, which organized also a very big march throughout the city. Uh, this is Szczecin. Uh, if you know Game of Thrones, Stark sisters are there. Uh, and uh, these are um, pictures from all over Poland. And as you see, um, this is from Vitlina. The small one, even if there were only a couple of people, like 10 people, 20, they went, uh, went into, into the public and wanted to make their uh, protest visible. And that's, of course, uh, something unusual for Poland, which for quite a long time had a very low level of people's engagement in um, this kind of demonstrations and um, basically civil society activities. And for me, as a scholar interested in social movements and 
uh, civil society, I, you know, go through all this literature, which says, in Poland, we have a very underdeveloped civil society. In Poland, we have, you know, we lag behind Scandinavia, of course, which is the, the good boy or a good girl of, of, of Europe in these terms. Um, but these issues, this, this situation show that there is a huge potential for, um, for engagement, for political engagement, for political manifestations. But the time has to be right, and there has to be circum specific circumstances, and there has to be uh, a whole range of different, um, let's say, cir circumstances or factors which has to come together. And I will talk about this today to show you my interpretation of what happened and why did it happen. How, how come that all those women and men as well went to the streets? Because, you know, going out to the streets with 30,000 other people is pleasurable. It, it's, it's fun, basically. But going out there with 10 or 20 or 30 people uh, and standing in front of people who actually disagree with you, that's not so pleasurable. It's, it's bravery. It really requires uh, stamina. It requires determination. It requires strength. It's, it's very difficult. And it, it's, it, it has been unpleasant for some of these women who were um, later... Uh, attacked or harassed by uh, anti-choice groups. So in that sense, um, the 3rd of October was just part of this wave, growing wave of this content. And uh, I would like to go through the um, chronology a bit here, because I think it is very important to see this demonstration as just a part of a larger effort to actually do something about uh, the issue of reproductive rights in Poland. So it all started in March when um, Stop Abortion Committee uh, started to gather signatures under the civil law proposal, which was uh, prepared by Ordo Juris Institute, which is a right-wing uh, organization, a uh, think tank, uh, which really works, um, which really tries to make the uh, issues of which is basically against um, reproductive rights, minority rights, LGBT rights, and so on and so forth. So uh, in Poland, as you may or may not know, it is possible for the citizens to submit a civic law proposal if they manage to gather 100,000 signatures, signatures not online, but real signatures, during a three-month um, three, uh, period. Uh, and then you have to submit it to the parliament, and parliament has to at least discuss it. Of course, it doesn't give you any, uh, any uh, guarantee that they will actually pass it, but at least they have to um, consider this proposal. So that was the moment uh, when uh, it, it, it became clear that there is a, a real threat uh, for what remains of the reproductive rights of women in Poland. Because in Poland, we have already very restrictive abortion laws. So theoretically, uh, the law allows for exceptions from the abortion ban in three cases. When there is a, a rape of, or incest, when there is a danger to women's health, and there, when there is a, a serious malformation of the fetus. But in practice, it is very difficult and increasingly difficult to obtain abortion, even in these cases, because uh, many doctors and even whole, whole hospitals claim uh, conscious clothes, so they say that they wouldn't perform abortion, although uh, Polish law allows for, for abortion in, this, um, in these cases. And uh, it wasn't the first time that this uh, proposal, such proposal, was actually discussed, because we had it almost every year. But it was the first moment where we had the parliament and the president and basically all authorities which suggested that, yes, they think it's a, it's a good idea. So basically, Otto Juris proposal um, would ban abortion at all. The only exception that was in the law proposal was that, in the bill, was that um, abortion would be, uh, could be obtained in the case of danger to women's um, health or life, but this danger would have to be immediate, which actually, in practice, 
could mean that women are in very um, dangerous conditions would have to wait until there is an immediate danger to their health or, or uh, life to obtain abortion. And also, it was a very, um, very harsh law because this law um, said that not only doctors who would perform abortions, but also women who undergo abortion would be uh, would face up to five years in prison. And that was something new because usually this um, this previous this previous bills would not include. Um, um, penalties for uh, pregnant women. So that was in March. Then immediately after they announced this plan, uh, different groups, different organizations and parties started to protest, to organize around it. So already in the beginning of April, uh, extra parliamentary left, extra parliamentary uh, left party Razem in cooperation with uh, group Dziewuchy um, Dziewuchom, Gals for Gals, which is basically a gathering of uh, women on the internet, on Facebook, during just the uh, first few days, uh, 100,000 women joined it. Um, they, they started to organize demonstrations and rallies. Then the next week, um, there was a um, uh, demonstration in Warsaw organized by feminist pro-choice organization or coalition of organizations. reclaim the choice. And uh, what is also very important, that there were initiatives, grassroots initiatives, sort of springing uh, here and there, organized, initiated by groups, by individuals, uh, like, for example, leaving churches during Sunday Mass, uh, or sending packages with wire coat hangers uh, to um, the prime minister's office because wire, metal wire hangers was, or still is, the symbol of illegal back alley abortions, especially in the United States, but it has become international. And uh, one of my favorite um, initiatives was uh, this kind of um, online action um, initiative, which was called Tough Period. And it included uh, women and some men as well uh, posting messages about their uh, periods, about you know uh, how they felt or what happened and how many tampons they used uh, on the prime minister's Facebook um, page. So the idea was that that you know if you really like to control our reproductive cycle, you really need to know a lot about it. So we will share the details with you willingly so you will be more effective. So as you see, there were quite a lot of um, irony and fun into, into these actions. Um, and then there was a moment where um, feminist coalition, feminist groups and organizations decided that we have to have uh, a counter proposal, uh, also a civic law proposal. Uh, so the coalition Ratujmy Kobiety, Save the Women, uh, was organized, was initiated, and they started to uh, to gather signatures. And I must confess that at that, that point I was I was scared because I remembered when we started to gather uh, signatures under a very similar proposal in 2011, and uh, we put a lot of effort into it, but we lacked resources. We lacked uh, people who could actually go out there and gather signatures, we didn't have money to, to mobilize uh, more people and so on. And we didn't make it by that time. And uh, I, was, I was kind of scared that this would happen this time, but luckily I was very wrong. So there was a lot of mobilization around that and um, a lot of people engaged into gathering signatures and uh, they managed to gather uh, almost a quarter of a million signatures under this uh, law proposal um, proposed by Ratujmy Kobiety Committee, uh, which was basically about uh, accessibility of contraception, uh, liberalization of abortion law, and also uh, sex education. Um, and so that was the moment where those two proposals, anti-choice and pro-choice, went to the parliament in the beginning of the new parliamentary year in September, and they decided to dismiss 
the pro-choice um, proposition at once, not even to discuss it, and to discuss the anti-choice proposition further. And that was the straw which sort, sort of broke the camel's back. That was something which really in um, um, the reaction was a lot of anger, uh, feeling of injustice, and a sense that in this that this is undemocratic process. That even though we would expect and we expected that the outcome would not go uh, the pro-choice way, the situation where uh, the power holders actually don't even want to discuss the proposal which was submitted by uh, 200, 200,000 um, um, citizens is undemocratic and deeply uh, offending. So that was the moment where this you know, growing wave sort of way started to grow even more. And uh, in the end, the, um, the parliament refused to or outvoted the anti-choice proposal by Stop Abortion Committee. And of course, the question is, was it a success? Um, yes, it was. Of course, the question of success is always tricky. And uh, in these situations, we have a long-term battle um, or long-term war instead of just one battle to, to be won. But in this particular situation, the main point and the main goal was to stop this proposal from being implemented. And that's what happened. Of course, it doesn't mean that the anti-choice groups uh, would just disappear or they would not uh, try to um, impose restrictions of different kind um, on the access to abortion in Poland. But that means that um, for, for the one thing, um, this situation showed that there is a response if the protests are um, big enough, and also it showed that um, there, is, um, there is a potential for mass mobilization which can have actual influence on what's happening in the parliament, even though these channels of communication between citizens and the power holders are now in Poland more or less closed. So, um, as you see, these uh, demonstrations which were organized they were organized by different groups, and they were quite big, and also, uh, I would say, they gathered much more young uh, women, young people, than is usually the case. And they gathered much more, um, much younger generation than in the case of Committee for the Defense of Democracy, for example, uh, which shows that there is um, potential for mobilizing the, uh, the younger part of the Polish population, if the situation is ripe and also if the communication and the tools for communication are the right ones. Um, so how and why, so why did it happen and why was it successful? Um, basically, I was looking at um, different issues uh, or different types of uh, interpretations which are offered by social movement theory, by feminist theory, and also I think that it's quite important to look at all those um, factors together. Um, we have a tendency, and journalists and um, commentators have a tendency to look for this one big thing which made it happen. And it usually, um, it usually doesn't exist. There are usually many issues, many aspects which come together at this particular point of time, and this actually um, leads to a change. Uh, and the first of all, emotions. Um, emotions are obviously there, right? We, we know about them, how they rule our everyday life, but also we have a tendency, especially the, the liberal side, to talk about, you know, that we should be rational, that, you know, political life should be ruled not by emotions, by, but by facts and um, ideas and so on. And I think that they are wrong. And I think that facts are there to actually steer emotions. 
And there is nothing inherently dangerous in emotions. They are just exist there and we have to know how to employ them, how to make use of them, how to, um, how to be able to convey our emotions to people. Because in this particular case, we had this move from fear where people, where women actually realize that, wow, this time is for real. And this time it can af affect not only women who actually want to undergo abortion, but also those who have miscarriages or those who want to have uh, prenatal diagnostics. Because if the proposed bill says that every person who even involuntarily will lead to a fetal murder can face up to three years in prison, that means that you cannot uh, undergo amniocentosis, for example because that it, this can lead to a miscarriage. So in that sense, this fear that so many people uh, or so many women actually started to feel turned into um, righteous anger when it turns out that they are not listened to by the power holders and that their ideas, their rights, their needs are dismissed. Um, then, I think we should see this mobilization as part of a larger process of reawakening of civil society. And part of this reawakening is that we had a normalization of street protests as a valid form of political particip participation. And I think that we should really think about it because um, if you look at, for example, studies by Jan Kubik and Grzegorz, Grzegorz Eckert from the 90s, uh, he, they discuss uh, how um, um, street protests, demonstrations in the 90s, uh, which were organized usually by, by workers, by people who were deprived of their livelihood because of the economic changes, were the only way to actually establish some sense of communication between the citizens and the authorities and the government and the parliament. But for a long time after, uh, these mass demonstrations were uh, discouraged or disqualified as uh, disruptive, as not really civilized, as in many ways um, showing a sense of underdeveloped civicness. So that's why we had quite a lot of negative reporting uh, on, uh, for example, uh, farmers' protests or miners', miners protests were coming to to Warsaw, and those protests usually had some, um, I would say, disrupt, disruptive elements. But part of this public discourse was that if you are, um, I would say, real citizen, and you were really thinking um, in terms of, you know, achieving a specific type of political goal, what you should do is to start an NGO and you know, do, do these kind of things, not really go on the streets and, and start to start to demonstrate. And that that changed during the last, I would say, two years um, because of this um, wave of mobilization against law and justice um, rule. And partly, uh, of course, we have a strong polarization of the Polish society and of the public discourse. And this a uh, strong polarization has a lot of adverse effects, but it has also some positive effects in the sense that quite a lot of people feel they, they can no longer afford being just by, bystander standards, right? So they feel this is the moment to take a stand. I cannot take it anymore. Uh, I cannot agree to what's happening. I cannot be the person who just sits on, on the sofa and do nothing. So in that sense, it, it, it has this kind of mobilizing power which tells people, this is the time to get engaged. This is now or never. Um, then, the question of support of the mass media, because, you know, for quite a long time, the issue of abortion was, um, it was, it was always there, but basically 
many also liberal mass media was not very interested in reporting on that. Uh, they were not so eager to report on uh, on um, demonstrations, for example, feminist demonstrations. And what happened during the last couple of um, months was that all those um, mass media started to um, report on that. And this is, for example, Gazeta Wyborcza uh, from the, um, the, the weekend after uh, this big demonstration on uh, on the 3rd of October. So they basically, it says we don't, it's quite an parasolic, we, we don't, we don't fold our um, umbrellas. Uh, as you can see, you could also have a sticker. So you could put this sticker on your laptop or on something. Uh, so basically they were not only reporting on that, but also considered themselves a part of the movement or at least supporters. A Polish women uh, won with law and justice, right? So, and this is uh, before these big uh, all women Polish strike, uh, we don't go to uh, work uh, on Monday. And uh, this is a lot of, uh, you can see a lot of women from Gazeta Wyborcza, but also many uh, intellectuals, artists, musicians, uh, basically celebrities who supported this, um, this issue. And also um, the, the amount of reporting was enormous. Uh, on the one hand, it's quite obvious. I mean, media like um, things that are big, that are massive, that, you know, they're spectacular. But at the same time, it was the first time for quite a long time where you had actually good coverage on, for example, what's happened when abortion is actually banned, like in Nicaragua. What happened then? Is it like, you know, everything well goes well and, you know, everybody's happy and women just give birth to healthy, happy children? Or maybe it's opposite, that they just go to prison and they die in hospitals and so on. Um, I think it will be really interesting to analyze the covers uh, of this, uh, of this um, um, biggest Polish weeklies, for example. This says, um, safe of... Um, of uh, God with a question mark, or this is the um, Black Monday or Black Protest uh, cover of Politica. And of course, not all of those were so, um, so I would say positive, but um, like this one, for example, which says war on abortion. And of course, who do we have here? Um, MP from Law and Justice, Ms. Um, um, Kristina Pavlovich, who, to my knowledge, doesn't have much uh, competence in the issue of reproductive rights, and uh, Barbara Novacka, who has been um, an activist for at least five or six years for women's rights. So, um, and it's quite interesting to see that finally, uh, the uh, the media noticed the role of the church in all of these uh, issues or in all all these um, debates, uh, which uh, has been discussed to some extent, but not really acknowledged um, so much before. And then we have uh, so in the sense it was very important to have the media on on our side, uh, or at least to have a space for. Um, experts, for academics, for activists, to share knowledge, to share experience, to talk about how, how it functions, what, are, what would be the outcomes of this kind of regulations, and so on. And then we have what, uh, what the um, social movement theorists call political opportunity structure. So basically what they say is that you have a bigger chance to win if your enemies are divided, for example. And I think that this is an element which is seldom talked about uh, and which I think was also very important for the outcomes of, of uh, this whole process. Uh, it was the division within the anti-choice uh, movement. 
because um, the step abortion committee led by um, Ordo Juris Institute was pushing for, um, uh, for prison sentence penalty for women as well. While um, the sort of older organization, uh, the coalition of um, anti-choice groups, were, was uh, against this kind of regulations. So they actually quarreled around uh, about this, and uh, part of the anti-choice movement refused to support this uh, proposal by Ordo Juris, and they actually uh, submitted their own uh, proposal a couple of months after, but um, in the form of a petition, not the civic law proposal, but a petition. So that also uh, means that the power of the impact of anti-choice uh, movement and organizations was divided because part of it were, was, was lobbying for um, a more harsher bill while the others were for um, the solution where women are not facing prison. Um, and then we have the strength of the Polish women's movement. And of course, when we talk about the strength of the movement, it's also tricky because, um, of course, comparing to what? I would say comparing to um, most uh, women's movements and organizations in the region. Uh, look at Hungary, for example, where women's groups and organizations have no strength whatsoever or resources to actually um, stand against Orban. Uh, but also in other countries, I must say that as a person working in um, Sweden, I'm always asked about you know women's movement in Sweden, which, which is strong to some extent. But I must say that during the 8th of March demonstration last year, which I which I took part in uh, Stockholm, I realized that it's smaller than in Warsaw. And of course, the country is much smaller, but at the same time, you could expect that the um, powerful mobilization could happen also there, um, which is not the case. So I would say that we tend to underestimate the strength, the resources, the knowledge base, um, the know-how that the Polish women's movement actually possess. And also the, 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 the um, uh, diversification of the movement, which part is more grassroots oriented, more, I would say, um, leftist and more avant-garde, while the other part is more, I would say, liberal um, um, and connected to the um, elites. It, it's also um, an advantage in this kind of situation where you really have to mobilize very diverse groups and very diverse milieus. And then the international connections and international movement. On the one hand, it is an inspiration, the Icelandic uh, strike, which has been an inspiration for the Polish women, uh, also connections to other uh, groups and mobilizations, uh, new unamenos in uh, Argentina and uh, Latin America, um, in groups, women's groups in Mexico, in um, um, other countries, both in Europe and uh, outside of Europe. And that kind of exchange of ideas, of know-how, of resources, uh, of inspirations was also uh, incredibly important and growing, I would say. That's why on the 8th of March this year, we had the International Women's Strike, which has been a part of the International Women's Strike worldwide. And finally, on uh, the issue of tools the internet and social media. Um, among, the, among scholars, uh, there is a division between those who are the enthusiasts and those who are, those who are the pessimists. So the enthusiasts uh, at the early days of social media said, oh yes, this will be democratizing tool. It will be great. People would talk with each other. There will be low cost of communication. This will be just great. Uh, after a couple of years, uh, people realized that, uh, well, it's not so easy. Uh, we have a tendency to close uh, our closed bubbles. Uh, we want to engage in a, meaningful, in, in a meaningful conversation, mostly with people that we already know 
or with whom we share a lot of uh, convictions. And of course, there is no sense of responsibility if people actually um, spread hatred and um, fake news over the internet. Um, right now, I would say there is a more tendency to look at how it actually works, what it does. And there are very interesting studies um, by Lance Bennett and Alexandra Segerberg, who talk about the logic of connecting of connective action. And they claim that because of these new tools that we have, the logic of mobilization changes. Uh, so to put the long story short, basically they said before, it was mostly about resources, about gathering resources, about uh, creating uh, organizational structure and about identity you know, forging a common identity, uh, policing the borders of this identity, and basically work on the, uh, on the sense of, you know, that we are all the same. What they're saying is that today it changed in a sense that organizational structure has been replaced to some extent by uh, content which is shared through social media and which is uh, and induced by emotions and to which people personalized. So the idea is that there is no one center which just, you know, creates uh, content or creates message which is then spread throughout the network, but rather people take this some pieces of information or memes uh, and then they make them theirs. And in that sense, they sort of subscribe to the specific movement and um, they can change a form of engagement. For example, with the uh, strike, the idea was, should we organize a normal strike, but how to do it if we are no longer working in factories where you can actually, you know, where you have uh, unions, where you can talk to people and organize and then just pick a day and say, today we are not going to work. So the idea was, okay, we can make it work by um, widening forms of striking, right? You can join the strike by not going to work, or if you have to go to work, you can wear black and wear pins, for example, saying that I am a part of the strike. You can organize a public meeting, you can organize a rally, you can, you know, have your children not go to school on this particular day. And at the same time, uh, all this will be counted as taking part in strike. Um, of course, the question is, yes, it works to enhance the tendency to get engaged and to have a mass mobilization, but how it works in, uh, when it, faces, when this mobilization faces um, the authorities, which don't change, right? They function the same way. So, of course, there are limits to, uh, to the theory and to actual um, engagement, but I think it's quite interesting to think about these changes in how we engage, how we think about ourselves uh, of as activists, and how this mass mobilization can um, get upscaled. So basically that's it. Uh, I have some things like, for example, the flag, which has been produced for, for the strike. So as you see, this, it has been uh, this, two, this sort of silhouette of a woman with this red thunder here, and, uh, uh, and it says, a women's strike which became a logo of, of a strike, I would say, and it spread also to other countries. It has been adopted by the international women's strike all over the world. Um, so these are the sort of symbols. Uh, and of course, the symbols have power to, um, which connects us to both past and the future. Um, but I'm not going to dwell into this much more. I would like you to talk, ask questions, comment. All, all uh, ideas are very welcome. Thank you very much.
I would just like to compliment the movement here. I was at the the uh, march with my wife, and we stood in the cold rain all afternoon. And and uh, I was so impressed, though, by the quality of the presentation. I'm originally from America, if anyone could not tell, and and it's such an angry conversation there. It's pro-abortion or anti-abortion. Well, well, no one in the world is pro-abortion. A little girl doesn't grow up saying, I can't wait to have my first abortion, or a guy or whoever to a doctor to do it. it it's it, The argument has been so mishandled there that it's two angry sides screaming at one another. And I was so impressed here. It was my body, my choice, not not I hate you because you don't want me to have one, or I hate you because you want to have. Nobody wants to have an abortion. It's it's it's, but it should be the woman's choice until a man can have a baby. I don't get a vote, but I was just very impressed with the quality of the way it was handled here versus the United States. So what do you think was the impact of the march in terms of changing the politics in parliament? I've spoken, but you turned the vote around. I didn't step because that's never been done before. Did, did we? <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not so optimistic about the Pope. I, I think that, yeah. Uh, when I look at his role in the anti-gender mobilization worldwide, he's not as progressive as, it, as he might seem. But um, what, would, what, would the, what did we change in the, in the parliament? Um, of course, the most obvious issue is that the uh, U.S. proposal has been dismissed. So that was the immediate change and the immediate impact. Um, but I think that we also managed to scare them, <laughs> which is a very, very useful um, tool to, uh, for social movements to be recognized as a powerful player and as, uh, as someone who uh, can actually uh, manage to gather so many people protesting that it cannot be ignored. Uh, and also I think we managed to... Um, introduce the issue of um, abortion as part of larger discussion about reproductive rights. Uh, and it's going back and forth, I would say, because for a quite long time, um, we, are, we have this conversation in Poland, and each time feminists talk about it, we put a lot of effort into saying, abortion is just a part of a package. We cannot talk about abortion if we don't talk about contraception, if we don't talk about sex education, if we don't talk about uh, quality of healthcare for women, because these things are connected. And talking about the abortion itself and all itself doesn't make much sense because it's part of the spectrum. And I think that we managed to some extent, a small extent, to convey it and sort of to put this on the agenda again, although it's kind of, you know, it's like Sisyphus, you know, going under this heel and, and feeling a bit lost on the way. But um, so in that sense, it has, um, it has an impact. But I think also there was, um, uh, in terms of strategies, there was a quite interesting change, which I observed as a, as a scholar, that so far, um, for example, in the, in the Polish parliamentary system, there, is, there are possibilities to enter uh, for citizens or for non-governmental organizations to enter the political process. And these uh, possibilities are quite limited, I would say. And uh, it depends on the politicians, if they allow us to come to the hearing of the commission, for example, or not. Uh, but I think what happened during the last year was that quite a lot of um, groups and individual women uh, started to feel that they want to be a part of it. So, for example, when there was a hearing about, uh, about um, um, 
either of the two proposals, there was a huge group of women who managed to enter the actual place where was it where, where, where it was discussed. Or for example, last week, I think it was last week, there was a discussion on in the uh, health commission about um, the El Lawan pill, the after the day after pill. Uh, so there was over 20 uh, women from um, all Polish women's strike or girls for girls or from organizations there asking questions uh, and basically showing that they care and that they are observing what politicians are uh, doing. And I think that this is extremely important. In that sense, I think American organizations are uh, are very uh, much more professionalized in the sense that they really use the tools such as, for example, calling your MP or calling your representative in Congress or in uh, or on the local um, um, authorities, sort of you know letting them know that you watch what they're doing and that they are responsible directly to you. So whatever you will do, they will give you. They will let you know what they think about it, right? So in that sense, I think it's also important um, as a change of strategies. And just one thing about um, um, United States. Um, hmm. I think that this particular mobilization was um, could be so wide because it was not only about the issue of abortion but also about you know health issues he health safety of women uh, who uh, are pregnant and have no intention to end the pregnancy and so on although there has been uh, part of the polish women's movement says uh, we cannot um, change the discourse on abortion if we will talk about abortion as the as something that is inherently evil. So, so there is a there is a small trend which which is sort of positive abortion trend, like for example with the slogan "Make abortion great again," uh, borrowed from you know who. Um, I'm not sure if abortion was ever great, so I'm not quite sure if we can make it great again. Um, and I have a trouble with that, which um, which basically, in my view, um, the problem is always how to make room for very different kind of experience that women actually undergo. So most of women, and this is shown in uh, many research which has been done all over the world, don't feel any regret after abortions. There are some who feel that. So, in my opinion, as for a women's movement, we have to make sure that we have make room for for all of those reactions. But politically, of course, as long as we we will say abortion is always wrong, then it's very difficult to to defend the right to to make this choice. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, it was really informative. I've got a. Um, a question sort of more along the lines of what the arguments are of the other side because well I've just um, I'm, I've just been here for I don't know a month or something and I'm always sort of deeply surprised about the whole sort of Catholic side of Poland um, so maybe you know, I don't know maybe you could uh, give us an idea of what the arguments are mm, yeah the thing with Catholic Poland is that um, if Poland was really so Catholic, you wouldn't need a law to ban abortion because people just wouldn't do it because they're Catholic, right? So that's the, the irony of it, right? I mean, um, why would you need to impose this on people if they truly believe that this is the wrong thing to do? So in that sense, I think that in Poland, um, the church now, especially now, is much more a political institution than it is a moral authority. So in that sense, if you look at the um, outcomes of uh, opinion polls, research, um, concerning um, you know, how people actually think or what they do in all areas, for example, about sexuality, right? I mean, if considering that we have 90% of 
posts which are Catholics, we shouldn't have 60% of posts who think that premarital, uh, pr premarital sex is okay, right? We wouldn't have 70% uh, who think that um, IVF, in vitro fertilization, should be allowed and supported by the state because it is condemned by the church, right? So in that sense, um, what I observe is the process in which um, the, Catholic, the, the Catholic side of the national identity is very strong and it's been strengthened by uh, consecutive governments because it is so much easier to promote this idea of, of a very homogenic uh, nation which stands on the firm ground of our Polish blood and our Catholic faith, right? And of course, for especially for um, autocratic regimes, um, having moral authority and being supported by the church is always important. Look at, look at Putin. He loves the, um, the um, Moscow um, um, Orthodox Church now, and he uses politically uh, the strength of the moral uh, authority of the church in order to strength, strengthen his own power. So in that sense, um, I would say that, uh, of course, the church has some moral grounds and it is very important uh, point of reference for many people who, um, who believe that this is a part of our identity. This is of also a very important part of our social life, of our customs, of our traditions. Um, but in a sense, it's also an empty shell because um, at the same time, you have only 21% uh, of people who actually go to mass every Sunday. Um, and you have very low a percentage of people who believe in all social teachings of the church and even lower percentage of people who actually uh, who actually um, do what the church says that should do. And it is very interesting with abortion because um, in the 90s, when um, in, in 1993, when this law um, banning abortion, was introduced, there was a very strong opposition towards this solution. There were over two million uh, signatures gathered uh, of people who wanted a referendum to be held on this issue. And uh, the new democratic government basically said, we're not going to do that. We are going to have this uh, outvoted and that's it. Um, and that was thought of as part of a process of democratization, which in the Polish case meant getting rid of whatever it was that was connected or associated with the communist times. And the access to abortion was one of those things, or gender equality was one of those things. So in that sense, the whole issue of the church as a moral institution, the church as uh, a source of, let's say, traditions and customs, and the church as a political institution should be carefully uh, discussed and separated. Because um, in, in my personal opinion, I think that the reason my church is powerful in Poland is that because we are hypocrites? And this kind of hypocrisy is strengthened by the political system and by the by the culture. And that's that's unfortunately something that uh, I I don't feel very proud about, but that's how it is. I think you know what happened in 1993 is that basically uh, the authorities have negotiated women's rights with the church. So gender equality was somehow sold to the church. They wanted this to have the church uh, somehow said, maybe blackmailed, they said they conditioned their support towards the very start of EU negotiations there with uh, you know, a new law on abortion. So of course there was a big opposition there because people were used to a totally different uh, scenario. You could argue that you don't have money 
you could use economical arguments not to have another child and it was also socially accepted as I understand from my grandmother for instance as I'm not a new banner to Poland my grandmother is Polish uh, that it was accepted then but I think that it, uh, if we could, if you could venture some like uh, future telling uh, here, would you see that this is uh, changing now again? That there is, um, I've seen some surveys from this winter showing that actually more people now than five and ten years back are for free choice. So this percentage is on the rise. So maybe in this, uh, you know, in this very difficult work of, um, yeah, that uh, the movement is doing, maybe we are actually getting somewhere. And I was also thinking about the role of um, uh, coming out, like my abortion stories in it, because we've seen very few, but still they were also covered by the mass media. So I think it might play a role. Maybe we need to hear more of, of those stories. Okay, um, I, I know that the, the lecture is explaining Poland to, um, to non-Poles. I am Polish and I would still like this country to be explained to me many times. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the <coughs> for the presentation. Um, what you asked um, uh, uh, about what are um, what because I have uh, I have watched I have uh, witnessed um, the um, the protests and all the preparations. I couldn't take part. Uh, my workplace does not allow me to get um, very civically active, so um, so I did not. But like I know the issue really from um, from all points, and 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 I remember um, what I thought. When it was, when it was being on, what I thought was were really like the um, the strong points um, on the um, on the uh, on the pro-choice side, and um, what were the weak points? Um, in your presentation, you used uh, the terminology that we should be using in Polish in Polish as well, pro-choice, anti-choice. But in Poland, we use pro-choice and pro-life. So. Um, you know the, the other side that you said, a spooky other side. Um, on semantic level, it creates a world. You know, if you are saying I am pro-life, that excuses you from everything because the other party, in uh, you know, in an, in an underlining assumption, is anti-life. Yeah? And we, we still we still have it totally in public discourse. So I would think um, one of the weak points or things. To, think about um, uh, for the future is really to be persistent on language, to reclaim the language and to like never say really that somebody's pro-life meaning what, that I'm pro-life as well. And actually I was imagining this kind of, you know, like I don't know, happening or something, creating, I don't know, collecting signatures pro-life because something and totally, you know, like reclaiming the language, like simply ridicule the, 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 the stolen sentence. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing, um, and you also said it, the hypocrisy. I think um, there's uh, during, I mean, uh, due to our history, you know, for a long time being partitioned in between then wars, then communism, um, we as uh, as a society, I prefer to speak about society nation, so, um, you know, um, so as a society, we have learned to cheat on the state the best. There were even studies like when you create a law, a, 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 a bill somewhere, you should give it to polls so that they find the loopholes, and then you can immediately because that's the truth. Yeah, how to go about because n no really um, authority has been nice because they were all or either imposed or we perceive them as imposed. So people kind of withdrew to the private, um, and uh, this time was a case when many people who just simply go about, you know, you go to Slovakia, you have an abortion, you deal with it somehow, they faced the wall. And it was like, no, I mean, that, that's, that's the last frontier. There's no way to cheat on the system any longer. So that's, for me, that was one of, of the things I noticed that, um, that it's really, I mean, we can't, we can't, there's no way to cheat any longer. So, uh, so, so it's really important. Um, and uh, probably the third, um, thing which I noticed and I like I wanted to also know European because um, Poland is the Polish society is not an individualistic society uh, we have grown from all these tribal uh, family things and I think one of part of the movement wants to um, insist on women's rights as the like primary thing to go to so it's my body my choice it's uh, it is like don't uh, hands off my uh, uterus or whatever the um, uh, the, the claims were, um, and I mean, 
with me totally fine. Only I'm thinking that um, what I lacked a bit maybe knowing how, how it uh, then goes out to the world is this common ownership thing, which has to include also men. Well, in this case, it's men, or it has to include state, like, like the connecting dots. We are talking about, for example, okay, so the new bill would um, ban abortion even if the fetus is uh, is genetically uh, is genetically um, uh, disturbed, and then there's there was no connection. Okay, so th there's it doesn't end with fetus. There's a child. There's a you know like I I, I liked a bit of this um, connection, and also I, I heard that before like when the movement started very early, there was for example. Um, an idea for um, uh, for ridiculing actually a uh, law proposal, which materialized lately in the U.S. I think, when they co would collect signatures for a bill that would forbid men from um, wasting semen because these are prospective children, and of course this is um, this the, the, the banning masturbation basically. So. Um, of course, it's a it, no, it's a ridiculous thing, but it puts the thing into perspective. So if everyone is in, then everyone is in. So I, I think there's a, a bit of this. Uh, well, it's not dichotomy, but these are two um, approaches. First, it is me, my body, my reproductive choice. But second, um, I'm not alone in this. So I think in the Polish case, knowing that we are not really individualistic, I think maybe this is something to be to be explored if if the issue to, is, is to go forward. And if it stays with only with the, it, it is women's, of course it is, but if it stays only there, I would fear that, that many people would say, you know, like would, would see this, oh, that's this young uh, career woman that just wants to abort and that's it, because they don't see the connecting um, factors. Yeah, thank you. I realized that I didn't really answer your question because I got so hooked up on the on the church, um, because the, the the main idea, the main um, the main conflicting point is the question of where life begins, and that's how the anti-choice side structured this debate. For me, the debate is not about definition of life because unfortunately we cannot come and agree on one definition uh, because biologically this is a process even the 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 the, 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 the fact of um, uh, of the connection I mean the process of connecting the sperm with the egg is not a moment it takes several hours and in the, in the discourse of the church or anti-choice groups, this is just the moment of conception. And from this moment, we have a human being. The problem is that biologically, um, there is no way to make um, a distinction uh, between a human being and just two cells because it is a process. And of course, there is a question, there's a, there are whole debates about um, how, do we, how should we treat, for example, uh, gametes. And this becomes even more important in the era of the development of biotechnologies, right? Right now, we have uh, quite well-developed or very well-developed technologies which allow us to, um, to manipulate human um, human uh, gametes or the embryo in many ways. Of course, in many countries it is, or most countries, it is forbidden, but not on the grounds that this is actual person, but on the grounds that it is part of the human body which has a potentiality to develop. And in most countries, um, where abortion is actually legal, this potentiality and this processual nature of the development of a human being is taken under consideration because there are usually limits on the on the time within time frame within which you can actually obtain abortion. But the problem is that if the discussion is only about whether 
a fertilized egg is a human being or not. There is no way to uh, achieve any meaningful debate or uh, to agree on anything. For me, this debate is and should be about the limits of the power of the state over its citizens. The question is not whether or not fertilized egg is or should be treated as a human being, but who should decide about it? Who does it belong to, this particular decision? And in that sense, it's very difficult to uh, convey this whole debate as a question about the relation between the state and the citizen. Because the question for me is always, who can impose on you the decision to bear a child? If especially, and this is what you said, uh, at least um, as I gather, especially if the state does not take responsibility for the upbringing of your child, right? So the question of responsibility is imminent here. And um, I think that the part of the reason why it has been so successful in Poland was because women understood that this is the imposition on, the, on their in most intimate decisions, right? How much more intimate can you get if you are invading someone's body? And uh, I must say that because I'm also analyzing or studying the debate on in vitro fertilization and um, uh, biotechnologies in, in Poland and else, elsewhere. This is also very interesting how it uh, develops, uh, how this discussion develops in case of in vitro. Because the Polish church and um, um, I would say right wing groups and politicians are also against in vitro. And the question is like, people say like, why this is the way to actually allow people who cannot have children to have children. So why would you ban it? You would ban it, as the church says, because, of course, one thing is that people should procreate in their bed after they get married. So that's part, but okay, let's say we forget about it. People don't care about it anymore anyway. So um, the thing, the real thing is that um, they claim that Usually, in the process, you uh, have to fertilize more eggs, if you are lucky, of course, to produce enough eggs, um, for more eggs that can be used in the process of implantation. In most countries now, there are limits uh, on the amount of fertilized eggs that you can actually implant in the uterus, up to two, sometimes three. Uh, of course, there are countries where you can have like eight, United States, uh, great. But and in any case, usually you have a surplus, or at least you can have a surplus of eggs. And then the question is um, embryos, basically, right? In the, in the process of uh, uh, in vitro fertilization, you harvest eggs from the women, then you put them on the petri dish, fertilize them with sperm. If you are lucky, they will get fertilized, start to develop, and after 48 hours, they are ready to be um, to be implanted or to be frozen in cryogenic banks. And of course, the question is, how would you treat those surplus um, embryos? The church says, these are children. So the Polish, um, Polish politicians like Minister Govin, by then he was Minister of Health, says, I'm hearing the despairing cry of those children who are put in the gas tanks. And of course, in the Polish context saying, they're put in the gas chambers. This conveys a lot, of course. We have to have Holocaust in every discussion in Poland. So, um, so basically, that's, that's the point, you know? If you, if you believe that the fertilized eggs should be treated as a full human being, then there is sort of no room for negotiation. But there is another thing which is even more interesting, and um, the nation really plays a role here and how we imagine the nation and who is, um, who is responsible for protecting the nation. Uh, Janine Holtz, American scholar, uh, wrote a very interesting piece in 2004 
about how in the dis debates on um, on abortion, um, the fetus has become a citizen, the ideal citizen, because th this is the citizen which doesn't speak, which doesn't make any claims. So, you know, if you position yourself as the defender of those citizens, you are inherently a good person and you can say whatever on their behalf because they are not speaking. And they, I mean, when they start, they are already, you know, um, feminists or labor unions, activists or whatever. So they are the sort of not really the purest citizens anymore. So they can be dismissed. But, but those embryos, these are the future of the Polish nation, right? And the nation comes here in two ways. On the one hand, there is this whole discussion about um, um, about the right type of children which are being born. Because this is something which is incredibly sad and uh, very disturbing. Because at the same time, when we have in, in the debate on uh, in vitro fertilization, where they talk about these despairing embryos in these cryogenic banks which have to be saved and so on. At the same time, they talk about children from in vitro. So those who are actually born, talking about the fact that they are uh, basically spreading lies about, you know, that they have 30% of um, rate of, you know, brain damage or they have some kind of heart problems or they have um, emotional attachment problems, they suffer from survivor, survivor syndrome because they somehow know they other, that other um, embryos have been healed in the cryogenic banks and so on. So this is a process in which you evoke, you create an ideal citizen that you speak on behalf of, strengthening your own position as the one who speaks for the good cause and sort of defends the future of the nation, which are always the nation's children. And at the same time, you uh, disqualify from full citizens' rights, which include the right to not being discriminated because of the way you were born, right? Um, children who are actually born after this procedure. So this is the very sad and sneaky part of the whole debate about, you know, children, reproduction, uh, what kind of, what types of reproduction are good and which are bad and so on. And which shows, in my opinion, that the issue is not about life or the sanctity of life. It's about the power of the political institutions, in this case the church, to be able to discern who are the rightful citizens who should enjoy full citizens' rights and who are not. So this is not so much about, you know, um, what we should do in our bedrooms or in, uh, in clinics. It's more about how this translates into political discourse and political decisions that are being made uh, on our behalf. So in that sense, I think it's, uh, but a punchline is very interesting because um, I've been uh, following this, this issue for quite many years and the debate on in vitro in Poland was started basically 2006, 2000, 2007. And by that time, around 56% of Poles believed that there should be a legislation allowing um, uh, at least heterosexual couples, married or not, to be able to get in vitro. And after seven years of intense anti-in vitro campaign um, uh, initiated and propagated by the church, we have 83% of Poles who believe that in vitro should be available for, uh, for um, um, heterosexual couples. So uh, in that sense, we can be hopeful. These changes sometimes go in a very unexpected di direction. So this, th these things change. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this. It's very 
inspiring, I have to say. Um, I come from Saudi Arabia and uh, I've been living in Poland for, for five years and really I could see a lot of things, a lot of changes uh, every single day even in Poland and uh, I was a, I was sort of a part of the Czarne protest but it wasn't there because to be honest I was a little bit afraid um, our government warned us, warned, usually they warn us not to get engaged in the political things because we are here only to study. And, but I did uh, participate in the Facebook uh, Charna protest hashtag and I posted my photo and to be honest, because I have a lot of uh, Polish friends, female friends, and I wanted to support them. It wasn't about, you know, because as you, as you see, I am a Muslim, and in Islam, this is like, you, 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 there are a lot of rules and regulations about abortion, but no one is talking about it. No, it's like, it's not something that, oh, we will sit together and we will talk about this. Not even sex, not even women's rights. So a lot of things where I come from, it's very, difficult to talk about so uh, posting my photo on facebook on china protest i posted it in the morning and i went and i left i was just uh, going somewhere and i got a call from my friend my polish friend and she said oh my god lama like uh, where are you right now and i'm like i'm, I'm i was at galeria mukurtov and i was like i'm at galeria mukurtov and she said like why why on earth is your photo on gazeta.pl like on the front page and actually, I had no idea what was Gazette BL before. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? Like when I, when I opened the, the page, I, my photo was there. And uh, because my, my quote was, uh, as far as I remember, that I stand with Polish women against this barbaric law. And when I opened Facebook, I had thousands and thousands of reacts on my photo and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments from men and women. And it was very overwhelming. And it's a lot of, a lot of positive comments from women and a lot of attacks from men, which was very shocking to me because I thought this was about women's rights and speaking up, but apparently, uh, coming from a religion like my religion, I had no right to talk in this issue. And by night, you know, the comments kept going and going and going, and I had to delete the photo because it was really overwhelming to me. A lot of uh, comments were really harsh, and a lot of them kind of uh, directed to me that I was not in a position to speak, even if it was with Polish women. And it really opened my mind. This wasn't about, this, this, this was huge. It was about silencing women all over the globe. It wasn't only about Polish women, it was all over. And it was really, it was really like um, overwhelming to me. And I want to, I want to thank you. This is really inspiring. To me, I feel like um, when I go back to Saudi Arabia, I want to do something like this. I want to raise awareness about sex education. We have zero. Literally, we have zero sex education back when I come from. Like seriously, I only learned about sex when I became when I came here, and I'm studying medicine, and it's terrible. I, I came here, I was 18, so I'm really hoping that when I go back, I could actually make a difference for Saudi women. Um, and my question is, because I got a lot of negative comments from men, how do men look? Uh, view this. I know that there were men also in the protest, but how do men view this issue? Polish men, I mean, in general. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess we should ask them because, as a sociologist, I feel always, you know, a bit uh, cautious about answering this question because. Frankly, I don't know how they feel about it. I think that depends on who we ask, because obviously, uh, if you look at opinion polls, we, you have a very interesting and disturbing um, difference in opinions among uh, the younger generation. If you look at uh, the population 18 to 24, you see that there is a huge um, difference between young women and young men. 
young men being the most, I would say, uh, conservative, right-wing, neoliberal at the same time group of, of the Polish society, while young women uh, have a, on, on general, right, on average, tendency to be much more left-oriented, equality-oriented than the average of the Polish population. So we have a very different, um, uh, very big difference of attitudes, as I said, on average. Uh, but at the same time, I think that um, for for many men, especially of the conservative um, uh, from the conservative um, milieus of or those who who share conservative views, this must have been really scary to see women in these numbers going to the streets, showing their strength, showing their determination. Um, it was aggressive. This kind of manifestations are aggressive. There is aggression, of course there is. It is not personalized, and uh, it is quite interesting to see that people with uh, uh, with these horrible banners, you know, uh, comparing uh, women who uh, are proper choice to Hitler and so on, they haven't been attacked. They haven't been bitten, right? Uh, although. Uh, physical attacks are unfortunately part of the Polish polit political life. But um, so, in that sense, I think that for um, for a number of men, this kind of um, showing of strength and solidarity among women must have been incredibly disturbing, and um, they, they they felt personally endangered by that. Uh, and in that sense, if you think about um, what male privilege really is, and it is the same like with white privilege. This is assuming that you have some rights and no one can take them away from you. Right? So when someone, when someone says, no, you don't, we are all equals, you feel that, no, there is, there is someone who t wants to take something away from me, which I just had, or I just have. So in that sense, um, I, I'm really happy to see so many men in these demonstrations, or so many men uh, during uh, feminist manifestations manifest that I've been organizing. Um, but I have no uh, doubts that for a number of men, uh, the situation of emancipation is something deeply threatening, and that it will um, lead to an extremely hostile reaction. And it's, it's very interesting to see what kind of reaction are these. Because part of it are um, the usual humiliation by, um, by um, commenting the outlooks. Right, so, oh yes, you're all ugly, and that's why you became feminist because you can get laid. And of course, the underlying idea is that women really depend on how men, um, you know, evaluate their looks. And they, this is this very, very funny moment where they say, like, I don't give a fuck about what you think about how I look. And this is this is the very disturbing moment where you know wow, th this doesn't work, what shall I do? And unfortunately, in many occasions, this leads to uh, more violence, to more um, threatening messages, to uh, physical violence, to situations where uh, this threshold between criticism and expressing your emotions uh, goes into um, hate speech. And the question of um, Islam and Muslim people is, in Poland, it's just incredible. Because uh, if you look at the opinion polls uh, two years ago, um, most, of course, this is mixed with the question of refugees for obvious political reasons, right? Uh, the, the level of uh, acceptance was fairly high, around 60% uh, had nothing to, had no, no issue with 
either Islam or Muslim people or, uh, you know, um, people who are refugees or whatever. I'm, I'm mixing these things here because they are mixed mixed in the public discourse, not because they are the, th the same things, obviously. But during the last two years, this has been so much politicized that, you know, we, it's, it's like, you know, in Poland you can have um, anti-Semitism with no Jews anymore, and you can have Islamophobia without Muslim people yet. So th this is this is you know how politics works, how the hatred uh, is useful politically because you can point the enemy because you can show the uh, the obvious threat, and because as I said, Catholicism is so has become during the last 50 years, basically, so so much entangled with the Polish nationality, uh, the question of religion is really important here. But here comes another interesting twist, because in Poland, as in ma many other countries, you have like two types of attitudes on the right uh, wing spectrum. One is that um, Islam is a threat in itself, and this is the story, you know, they will overcome us and make us do things that we don't want to do, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the other thing is that, oh, we are so good to our women. Look at those Muslim or Arabic countries. They have so horrible lives. So why Polish women demand anything more? You are so much more, um, you know, um, um, you have so much better lives, you have rights, you can drive cars. Why would you say something bad about the gender order in Poland while there are countries where women have so much, uh, you know, more difficult lives? So in that sense, it's, um, it's an argument which, which is very often used in these political discourses. Um, for one, to create an enemy, so if we, we have an enemy, so we have to stand all together and, you know, uh, militarize our, our social systems and uh, our economy. And on the other hand, this is also a counter argument which shows that Polish women have so, are so emancipated, have so many rights and so, are so, you know, great that, you know, they, they shouldn't expect anything more because obviously there are so many women who have it worse. So wh why would you expect or demand anything? Exactly what I realized after, you know, the, the backlash on my photo, I would say, that I realized that a Polish women had no rights because, well, other women already have no right and Polish women has a lot of rights, so they don't have a right to complain. And then I had no right because I had so many other issues issues that I had to work on first before standing with Polish women. So both women had no right to speak at all, like from Poland or from Saudi Arabia, all of us had no right to speak at all. And it was really, really annoying to me. Yeah. Um, I would just add one thing because um, um, hate speech on internet or all these hateful comments, I, I wouldn't be that, um, well, no, I would be serious about not liking them and, and you know, like dismissing them. But um, a, a lot of people just write shit because they have shit in their head. And, and there's a lot a lot of hate speech in, 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 in Polish internet compared also to other countries. I know it has just become, I know, some venting um, way for people to write whatever. So, it, so of course, of course, the, 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 um, as, 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 the, uh, as the polls show, um, the opinions are there, and 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 the uh, um, uh, the fear and the hate is there. But still, you know, like what goes on the internet, like don't, uh, yeah, just, yeah. Um, but your your question was very interesting, and and it's coming back a, a bit to um, to what I said about the um, uh, about what in in the protest for me um, is a bit uh, um, yeah missing because the common ownership. Because as you said, like um, where where are the Polish men in this or in any of this? Like the um, uh, again, putting um, 
um, putting uh, that you have to have a doctor's permission to um, to purchase late uh, late contraception. Um, saying all the time that these are women's rights, that these are women's reproductive rights, that this is about their freedom, which of course it is, and I do not want any uh, like shadows here. But saying that and 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 ending there and not saying that this is not like you know feminism in its idea is about a society that um that uh, that respects all you know we have a father that has a daughter and he should want to have his daughter to be to be free and enjoy all the rights because it's his daughter simply and yeah? so it should be a case for all and of course those who are directly touched it, it is closer to skin that that's 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 totally um, uh, obvious. But what I'm saying is like this component exactly. We're saying that this is our common issue. That if, um, if for example, you, uh, if there's a law forbidding, I don't know, prenatal um, uh, checks to establish whether um, uh, the fetus or our born child, as as is as is in, in the Polish discourse, is not only a woman's issue. There's a dad somewhere as well. So um, I, I think very often in um, in such, and I am also speaking from a sociologist perspective here, I am one as well. So um, what, what, what is very important in such uh, protests which, where you bring um, forward an issue is to look around who can like cross cut not to antagonize people. I, I remember many reactions where, um, where men were, were saying during the protest that uh, you know they, they don't like it. I, I mean they, they just want to do anything uh, everything what they want and we don't count so this there's this big fear of being just simply dismissed as an i don't know semen donor that's it and that's basically where where all the patriar patriarchalism uh, uh, came from because women know that it's their kid a guy can never know so there's the i mean the, the you know the wish to to control others is exactly because of this you can never know like 100 percent. so it's better to lock someone at home and then you are certain right uh, but I think really in such, uh, be, be that women's rights, uh, or reproductive rights, political rights, uh, I know religious rights, like always uh, uh, like look if there can be an ally or if there can be a fear on the other side that will then turn badly because when people fear, then they get the most aggressive, no? I think in many, in many, in many statements by men during the protest, there was fear, like visible fear. We we just not even we lose control over you, but we lose control over something which is ours as well. But nobody's speaking that it's ours as well. So I, I think this, this this element of uh, of showing common ownership of how uh, how things work in the uh, in the discussion is extremely important. That's yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so I think we will try to sum up at this point. Um, the issue of common ground is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question because um, if you think about moving, because there has been a move throughout the last 20 years from um, women's rights to anti-discrimination approach, right? which has to do with uh, um, transnationalization of the women's rights, which has to do with how transnational institutions such as uh, United Nations or you know, U European Union works and so on. And in that sense, um, it makes sense, right, to have the anti-discrimination approach and uh, to think about discrimination as not so much connected with only gender or only uh, race or only level of ability or sexuality, but with a whole range of or intersections um, of those issues which fluctuate over time because at one point of the time we can be more, more vulnerable than in others. At the same time, um, this move often ends uh, or results in sort of dissolving specific groups which slowly disappear 
in a sense, right? So then we have anti-discrimination law, which is so general, doesn't really talk about women's rights as something which we should achieve, but puts more uh, pressure on actual discrimination and redressing this discrimination. As you can imagine, these are very two very different two, two very different political goals. And of course, the question of gender and you know to, to what extent um, men can be involved in um, in feminism basically or a movement um, is a very tricky one. Um, and it, it becomes even more tricky when feminists talk about issues which concern mostly men, like, for example, um, promoting father's leave. Uh, I must say that I have been in a couple of occasions as an expert uh, in, um, you know, debates with governmental bodies and so on. And it was very funny feeling to, to um, realize that I'm the only person here, and most of people there were usually men, who are advocating um, prolongation of um, paternal leave, leave for fathers only, right? My question is, do really men want it? Do, do they really want to spend more time with their kids? I don't know. And frankly, I think many of them don't. Although we know that it's good that you have a connection with your children, that you have better health, that your, um, you know, your marriage is more stable, and so on and so forth. Um, so in a sense, it's you know the question of who owns which part of the issues that we are fighting for is always a sensitive one. And for me, it would be wonderful if we could have as many connections as and as wide um, coalitions as possible. And right now, I think that with the situation worldwide, it is a necessity. But at the same time, I think that we should be really cautious about, you know, thinking about it in terms of um, having the same goals, because sometimes we don't have the same goals. And with gender equality, unfortunately, men has something to lose here. For those who want to have, uh, you know, great positions, if we have gender quotas, some of them wouldn't have them. If we have gender equality in the household, they would have to pick up dirty dishes. And frankly, I don't know people who really love that. Most people, men and women, just don't want to do it. And in that sense, of course, in the long run, I think that it would have it would be very beneficial for both um, men and women and for their relations. But at the same time, I I would be very cautious with uh, you know promoting the idea that these are those wonderful things that we want to sh you know share with men. Some of them are not wonderful. <laughs> And some of them are things that we just don't want to do ourselves because we are so fed up with them. So it is a struggle, political and otherwise. Um, but I hope that it will be a successful struggle in the long run. Thank you so much. <laughs>